Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing story of Pensacola, which is North America's first place city. Today we want to begin the story of newspapers and how they have affected life here in our community. Now, you know, back in the early, early days, a newspaper was something that every community wanted. The idea began, of course, with the, with, well, I guess we would today call coffee houses, where people got together around a cup of coffee and just exchanged what news they had. The idea of printed newspapers, well, we could begin to trace them basically from the latter part of the 18th century, uh, but they, not every community had one, of course. Now, when Pensacola itself became part of the United States. This was in 1821. One of the first things that we were fortunate in having was that a, a former army man by the name of uh, Corey Nicholas, a major, arrived here with a man who had a, a small, owned a small printing press. His name was uh, George Tunstall. And they set up stop, shop downtown and created what became known as the Floridian. It was a little two-page paper which came out once a week and apparently did not, did not uh, succeed very, mu very well, even though it was very inexpensive. Part of the problem, of course, was that at this time when the, the uh, Florida became, and Pensacola became part of, a, of North America, very few of the people could speak English. So it was a great problem for, the, for someone doing a newspaper. Uh, one of the things that the Floridian did do, of course, that we want to remember, that they were the first one to print all of the ordinances which Andrew Jackson brought to Pensacola as the base of government for the city of Pensacola. And they did this, and the, the Floridian carried on for about two years and then, then folded. About this time, another gentleman by the name of William Sent uh, reorganized and started a second newspaper, which he called the Gazette and Advertiser. And he operated along for about a year and a half. And then he was approached by a recently arrived young man by the name of Benjamin Drake Wright. Now, Wright was a, an attorney who had come here, just, just arrived really from, uh, from Philadelphia. And he had a little money. And he had, for some reason or other, Wright had always wanted to be a journalist. So he, he bought the newspaper, but kept sent as part, kind of as his partner. And these two men now proceeded with the Pensacola Gazette and Advertiser, which they, they sold on a, on, a, on a contract basis. You could buy a, a full year's contract for the uh, a subscription for two dollars and a half, and the newspaper came out for uh, every Thursday, and it was printed in a four-page format, very small type, very type all jammed together, very difficult to read, and the uh, well, nonetheless, at least we had a newspaper. Now, twenty years went by, and in 1845, another man by the name of Philip Lavallee pop began to produce the Democrat and Advocate. This was a, a rival paper, and how how it, how we managed to support two newspapers with a population of about 18 or 1900 that's a little hard to tell but but they did the get a gazette and advertiser continued forward and I want to mention one thing about this as we approach the latter part of the of the 1850s it was in this period that two things began to happen number one the uh, a man by the name of Morgenthaler up in Philadelphia developed a machine which he called a linotype. This made it possible for someone sitting at a keyboard to operate with a vat of uh, hot lead and literally to punch, punch letters or numbers and have this, this, these characters produced in a matrix that was then, when the, when the lead had cooled, that material could be set, in type, set as part of the columns of a, of a newspaper and it vastly increased the speed of preparing a page of a paper. About the same time, another organization up north began uh, producing what they called, uh, they, uh, these were, were uh, oh, electrotypes. I almost forgot the name here. They were called electrotypes. And an electrotype, well, you kind of have to visualize it this way. An electrotype was made of, a, began with something about the consistency of an egg carton. Very soft material. And the, basically what could be done when, a, when a, a producer up north put together a full page of all kinds of news. It could be national news, international news, puzzles, recipes. He put this together and pressed that into the electrotype. And and then he would send that on contract, of course, to a small paper like the Gazette, and they could then refill that matrix with hot lead, and there they would now have the equivalent of a full page of their newspaper. And so that, now the Gazette would have paper uh, material that would come from all over the country, and it was a, a great boon to the uh, to the newspaper publisher, and it was very fortunate for, for Pensacola and, and other places, because one of the features that came forth initially on the with electrotypes was a reproduction of the 
famous Lincoln-Douglas debates, which were taking place in, uh, in, in uh, Illinois at that time as a prelude to the terrible events of the Civil War. Well, when the war came, of course, newspapers were out of business for quite a while. But by the time we reach 1868, the, the Gazette is back in business. And by this time, we, are, we, we can see them all covering all kinds of exciting things that were happening in the post-war era. And, and the, uh, the, the, the paper was a success. Mr. Wright continued on as its owner for quite a long time. He, he, uh, Benjamin, Wright, Benjamin Drake Wright was a, a very long-lived man, and he was a, a man who was a very wise one, and his editing and the publishing of his paper was something that we can all look back for on very, very happily here in Pensacola because much of our history of that period can be taken from what he wrote. Well, by the time we get into the, into the 1870s, we have a, we have a, a a whole series of uh, competitors beginning to come down the pike. By the time we get to the uh, to 1878, another group by the name of uh, with two men rather by the name of Frank, Charles McGee and Frank Phillips put together a, a new paper called the Advance. One of their owners was young Stephen Mallory, the uh, the young son of Stephen R. Mallory, the former uh, Confederate uh, Secretary of the Navy. And Mallory, of course, had, was trying to advance his own uh, political career, career as well, and he did. We moved into the next uh, next. Uh, decade and another young man comes to Pensacola and by the name of Dennis Wolf and Wolf begins to pr produce a new paper which he called the commercial now I must confess to you I, I cannot understand how uh, two or three or four newspapers could possibly have survived economically when they were charging two dollars and a half a year for their total service and uh, of course they had some advertising revenue but not a whole lot but nonetheless they did uh, Dennis Wolf we need to, to need to concentrate on for just a minute Dennis Wolf was a political activist. He came on the scene just about the time that William Dudley Chipley and the Pensacola and Atlantic Railroad and the l &N Railroad were beginning to make a big splash in this community, buying uh, land and also uh, building new facilities down on the waterfront. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Wolf didn't like Mr. Chipley. He began to be a big critic of him, and his editorial policy was scathing as far as the, some of the things that Chipley did. So as the, as the, uh, as the decade advanced, Mr. Chipley finally said, all right, that, uh, enough of that. We've had enough of that kind of foolishness. So he, he came together with two or three mem members of his uh, railroad crew, include, including Richard uh, Carey, and they decided to uh, create a competitive newspaper that would, would uh, try to uh, neutralize what Dennis Wolf was printing, and so they created the Pensacola News. Now, subsequently, uh, Wolf's paper was renamed the Journal, and these, these, this, this continued on for some time. And there was uh, also another paper cre pre created in the same period was by a man, na by a man named John O'Connor, which was uh, called the Pensacola. And so you had three papers running side by side here in, through the 1880s. But when the, uh, when the news came into being, when Mr. Chipley and Mr. Carey produced the news, they ultimately bought out Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. O'Connor, and he took over, and he became, in effect, he became the publisher, although the others were the owners. Uh, there were other some specialty newspapers that came into being in our community. In the late 1880s and early 90s, a man by the name of W.J. Van Kirk, who was the, basically the land sales agent for the l &N Railroad and the Pensacola Atlantic. And of course, by now, the railroad had this tremendous acreage to sell across much of uh, the Panhandle, Florida. And Mr. Van Kirk's newspaper, we, I, we, it's hard to call it a newspaper. It was more of a, a sales piece than anything else. But he produced this, uh, this paper, which he, uh, he, he circulated over a quite a large area in an effort to tell some stories about Northwest Florida, brag about it a little bit, and of course, as he did so, to try and sell real estate. Uh, but we moved down uh, in the latter part of the of the uh, 1890s. We see um, John Connors continue to produce successfully. And then finally, we come into the period of, uh, of the uh, 1890s, late 1890s, and Mr. Chipley and, uh, and some of his associates have passed on, and so has Dennis Wolfe. And so now the papers are their papers that they had founded are repurchased, and the the news is purchased by a man by the name of Percy Hayes, and a Mr. W William A. Lofton buys the journal. So now as we turn the page into the 20th century, we've got two own, new owners for both the news and the journal, and the two papers continue on. They are now well, step by step. They are becoming daily papers and becoming a little bit larger as the population permits. However, they are still very inexpensive, two or three dollars a year for a total annual subscription.
We get to the year 1922 and something big happens. At this point in time, a man came to town who had no other ties previously with Pensacola. His name was, was John Perry, John Perry Sr. Mr. Perry already had put together a kind of a, a combination of about 25 weekly and daily papers and some specialty uh, papers uh, throughout Florida and up into Georgia and Alabama. And Mr. Perry came to town and made a, an offer to both Mr. Mr. Hayes and to, uh, to Mr. Uh, Mr. Loft said, we, I would like to buy your papers. And he did. And so immediately, the first thing he did, of course, was to consolidate the news and the journal into a single company. He closed down one set of offices, uh, consolidated the presses, and now at this point in time, the news journal company became one. And Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Perry was a very successful journalist, and as time passed, he was very wise in some of the people whom he chose as his leaders. Now, of course, uh, during the, the latter period of the 1920s, things were, were booming for newspapers here, but when we came into the Depression years, uh, the, the papers suffered just as everyone else did. It was in the latter part of, the, of this period that uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Perry became uh, acquainted with a young man who had just come out of the, uh, the little college over in Defuniax Men. This man's name was Braden Ball, and Mr. Ball and Mr. Perry got along extremely well together. And as the as Ball matured, he moved up in the in the news journal hierarchy and ultimately became the the publisher first of Perry's newspaper in Panama City, and then pub, uh, publisher of the Pensacola News and Journal. And Mr. Braden Ball would carry on as the combined publisher up until the year uh, 19, I believe it was 1973. And at this point in time, we at this point in time the uh, uh, Mr. Perry Sr. had died and the papers had been taken over by his son John Perry Jr. Mr. John Perry Jr. had other fish that he wanted to fry. He was interested in other forms of, uh, of technical research. He was a, a very brilliant scientist and so he decided to sell the news, the news in the journal, which he did to the, to the Gannett Corporation. Well, this was the date of uh, early 1970s and the, the sales price was about fifteen and a half million dollars. And of course the, the, the Gannett people took over and within a few years, Mr. Ball retired, and a whole succession of, of people became the publishers. I'm just going to read off the name because they, they may not mean much to our audience today, but then again, they may. These were in order now. James Jesse, Cliff Barnhart, Paul Flynn, uh, Mr. Andrews, Denise Ivey, and then, of course, as of the early part of the 21st century, Mr. Kevin Doyle. Uh, as all of this took place, of course, uh, and we move into the, the latter period, things began to change. Because by the time we reach the early part of the uh, of the 21st century, journalism across the country is changing because the the of the competition coming not only from the existing uh, broadcast media, but now so much more news became available on the internet. And so, stage by stage, and slow but sure, uh, the newspapers, not only in Pensacola but elsewhere, began to see a reduction in their advertising revenue. And when, of course, the advertising revenue began to fall, this meant that there was less money to use in putting out the news newspaper and slowly the papers everywhere began to shrink. Adding another journalistic voice to the area is the Independent News, a weekly journal which originated here in 1999. The News is the latest of many weekly papers which came and went. However, this paper successfully reached out to a broad, generally younger audience, highlighting strong editorial opinions and with professional coverage of the arts and of lifestyle elements. The paper is owned by a group of local entrepreneurs. With less overhead and a more youthful approach to the community, independent news has become a, a more meaningful factor in journalism in the 21st century. Radio, television, other media, all are, are into the news business, but even in those other media, uh, advertising revenues have, have declined. So it's a little difficult to tell where uh, John Doe and Mrs. Doe are going to get their news, where the, what they're going to get around the, the breakfast table each morning. Uh, it's a little hard to tell. We've gone a long way from the old coffee shop to today, but obviously things are changing and we may see something quite different by the time we reach the middle of the 21st century.